The pandemic lockdowns and resulting easy money created a lot of bubbles. Bubbles that have recently been significantly deflated thanks to the Fed's monetary policy reversal. Well, not all bubbles. One that has been slow to react to the changing market conditions appears to be the housing market. Now, many perceive the housing market to be more resilient than stocks, bonds, or crypto. But if there's anything 2008 has taught us, it's that bricks and mortar can be just as frothy. So, are we heading for a massive correction? Well, that's exactly what I'll be looking at today. Don't go anywhere. Okay, so this is the Coin Bureau. Okay, as you can see, very spacious, fantastic views over the whole landscape of finance, educational and objective content as standard, super high levels of research, and 100% hype free. That's right. Now, I do need to warn you, though, that there's no financial advice here. So if you are in the market for that, you'll need to look elsewhere, okay? Some lovely additional features, too. So if you tap that subscribe button and that bell icon down there, then you'll automatically get alerted every time another video appears on the channel. Yeah, I know. It's a really nice touch, ain't it? Uh, what else? There's also timestamps just down there as well. Yeah, a lot of places are putting those in now. Really, really classy touch if you ask me. Okay, so have a look around, see what you think. Any questions, give me a yellow. Oh, uh, yeah, just to let you know, there is a resident crypto expert too. Comes with the place. Yeah, name of uh, Guy. That's right. Yeah, apparently very well housebroken, pretty good tempered, no problems reported. Okay, so I'll leave you guys to have a snoop around, shall I? Okay, great. Estate agents, eh? Don't you just love them? Now, the pandemic came at a weird time for the global housing market. It came when the fundamentals of the market were already slanted towards a price appreciation. For example, it happened to coincide with generational shifts for large groups of people, not least of which was millennials. Now, a large proportion of these people were starting to house hunt. And this meant that you had a great deal of natural housing demand coming to the fore. Some were looking to move out of big cities into the suburbs. Others wanted to start families and own their own piece of the American dream. But they all came at about the same time in the housing market's life cycle. And this natural demand for housing became pronounced in the US and elsewhere. However, supply was not as readily available. And this is for two principal reasons. Firstly, the phenomenon of people staying in their homes for much longer. The number of people who'd lived in their homes for more than 20 years went from just 7% in 2005 to a full 25% in 2020. So there were fewer people putting their houses on the market. On top of that, there's also the fact that the construction of new homes has been lagging in recent years. That's because many of the house builders who were hit hard by the 2008 crash just haven't recovered. General shortages of skilled labour also contributed to this supply crunch. And naturally, this imbalance between housing demand and supply led to an increase in prices. And this was before the pandemic rolled into town. COVID's unwelcome entry into our lives dialed this imbalance in the housing market up to 11. Or, more specifically, the reaction by governments and central bankers dialed it up. Firstly, although the shutdowns led to one of the biggest drops in employment in economic history, this was supplemented by generous fiscal measures like stimulus checks and unemployment grants. Therefore, household income didn't collapse as much and, as a result, didn't crash housing demand. In fact, the policies of the central bankers supercharged that demand. That's because in order to stimulate the economy, the Fed and other central bankers dropped the Fed's fund rate down to zero. This obviously meant that interest rates throughout the broader economy also hit near record lows. That included rates on the mortgages people used to buy homes. Savvy millennials saw this as their chance to finally get on the first rung of the housing ladder. Borrowing was cheaper than ever. 
So demand went through the um, roof. And over on the supply side, things were also looking much tighter. That's because even fewer houses were being built. Firstly, when we had those rolling lockdowns, building companies could not start work, either because of the restrictions or because of a shortage of workers. And even if they were able to start building, procuring materials became much harder. Thanks to massive supply chain disruptions, these materials became scarcer and more expensive. Basics such as lumber and piping became commodities. The convergence of this hot demand and limited housing supply meant that prices went skyward. You can see that here with this chart. Prices were shooting up across the board, with those in some areas reaching unprecedented levels. Now, this situation was, of course, not confined to the US, as housing markets in a number of other countries were also rallying for similar reasons. But it wasn't until earlier this year that these housing price rises started ringing alarm bells. About two months ago, researchers at the Dallas Fed released this paper, which claimed that signs of a US housing bubble were appearing. It basically took a look at real house prices, i.e. adjusted for inflation, over the past two years and showed that these were higher than fundamentally justified. One of the first charts to look at is this one over here, which tries to give an idea of US, quote, housing exuberance. At the top is the real house price index that had been based at 100 in 2005. As you can see, real house prices are higher now than they were in 2005. Below that, they've plotted a chart with their real house price exuberance indicator. It's based on recursive right-tailed unit root testing, and if that sounds complicated, it's because it is. If you want to dig into it, I'll leave a link to the paper below for some light bedtime reading. Anyways, they've plotted this indicator together with the bounds of the 95th percentile. Periods where the indicators are above the 95th percentile can be viewed as periods of rather extreme exuberance from a statistical perspective. As you can see, we've been above the 95th percentile in the last three quarters since 2021. The only previous period where it was significantly above the 95th percentile was back in the 2000s. We all know what happened towards the end of that decade. So that's a little alarming. But there are other benchmarks that they look at, including the price to rent and fundamental price to rent ratio. The former is straightforward enough, but the latter looks at a benchmark for a fundamental price. They try to get a proxy of this by running a discounted cash flow analysis on the monthly rental payments. The main idea here is that if the price to rent is much higher than the fundamental price to rents, markets are overvalued. As you can see from the top of the chart here, the price to rent is running way hotter than the fundamental price to rent, a divergence not seen since 2008. They've also done the same exuberant statistical analysis here, and you can see that these are far from ordinary. Now, one more bubble indicator that they look at is the price to income ratio, which is also self-explanatory. If prices are rising faster than incomes, then it's becoming less affordable in general. Now, while these indicators are not yet in the exuberance phase over here, you can see that they are rising quickly. It's also important to point out that in this time period, we also had a surge in real disposable income as a result of those pandemic measures. The authors point out that if these rises in household income turn out to be transitory and monetary policy starts to reverse, these disposable income levels start dropping and hence could further drive it into over-exuberance territory. So, based on this analysis, there do appear to be signs of housing market trouble brewing. The fact that this report came from a branch of the Fed is also particularly concerning. And for those of you not based in the US, I wouldn't breathe a sigh of relief just yet. That's because these researchers also analysed the broader global housing markets and were similarly concerned that they were running into a, quote, fever. Now, I'll leave this as well as their US housing market analysis in the description for you to read later. Definitely worth a gander. But since that report, things have changed quite considerably in the global macro space. And with these changes have come signs of housing market cracks. 
Perhaps one of the most important developments since the pandemic housing boom has been a sharp reversal in monetary policy. As we've covered a number of times on this channel, the Fed was caught flat-footed by inflation and has decided to completely reverse course. Since March, the Fed has raised rates twice to a total of 75 basis points. These rate increases will naturally impact on interest rates across the broader economy. The more it costs for banks to borrow from the Fed, the more those banks will charge for a mortgage. To give you an idea of how much higher mortgage rates have risen, at the beginning of the year, the fixed rate for a 30-year mortgage was sitting at 3.29%. Today, it's as high as 5.44%. These are the highest that they've been in over 10 years. Translated into average mortgage payments, this means that the monthly payment required to buy a home has risen by 50% since September. This means buying property has become that much less affordable for those same millennials who were driving up the market in 2021. This would help explain the fact that mortgage applications in April were only 50% of where they were this time last year. Fewer people applying for loans means that there are naturally fewer buyers. In the same month, sales of new US homes plummeted by the most in nearly nine years. And this fall in sales has already started to impact on the prices that agents are seeing homes being sold for. In some of the hottest metros in the US, some sellers are having to do the unthinkable, accept offers below asking. On top of that, it seems as if the glut in building material supply chains has eased up somewhat. One of the main drivers on the supply side in 2021 was those exorbitant lumber prices. Well, a few weeks ago, these prices reached their lowest level for the year. More building supplies on the market means cheaper inputs and therefore lower prices. To quote economist Ian Shepherdson, quote, the party is over. Now, I happen to agree with him. Yes, you have the stats to back it up, but you also have to consider how much more rates are likely to rise. The Fed has made it clear that it is going to do whatever it takes to stave off inflation, and that will mean some pretty aggressive rate hikes. If the Fed's fund rate goes over the 3% level that some are expecting, that will make mortgages prohibitively expensive. So, are we likely to see a replay of the 2008 housing crash? Well, not quite. While the US property market is indeed due a correction, the main difference we have in today's market is the fact that homeowners are a lot more creditworthy. If you cast your minds back to the 2008 financial crisis, one of the biggest contributors to the housing contagion was the prevalence of subprime lending. People with bad credit ratings were able to get home loans as easily as they were able to get credit cards. In some cases, the banks didn't even care about the credit ratings of the borrowers. That was because as long as housing prices were going up, so too was the value of the collateral. If a borrower could not afford to make their payments, the bank could just repossess the house and flip it at a profit. Predatory lending practices abounded. Perhaps one of the most prevalent was deceptive adjustable rate mortgages. Those that appeared to have really low interest rates or payments initially, but which would significantly ratchet up after a few months. Naturally, these rates went to levels that the borrower could not afford. But the banks didn't care, as they could always sell those houses on, or so they thought. And while the issuance of adjustable rate mortgages has recently shot up to a 14-year high of 9%, it's still a long way off from the peak 35% that we saw in the last cycle. This means that although interest rates are rising, they are unlikely to lead to mass foreclosures that would nuke the housing market. One final thing that does not appear to have taken place in the most recent housing boom, but that was seen in 2008, is additional leverage. Basically, back then, people were able to use the equity that they had in other home loans as collateral for down payments on new homes. This layered on the affordability. Moreover, in response to the 2008 crash, the government instituted a number of guardrails that would help prevent these types of unsustainable loan issuances going forward. These have, by and large, kept the mortgage issuers in check. 
Finally, the demand drivers in this recent housing boom, albeit frenzied, were powered by underlying fundamentals. People were looking for houses to live in. During 2008, people were often merely buying up house upon house because they all thought that house prices would only ever go up. No one had ever experienced a broad crash in US housing, so they assumed the party would never end. So it appears that we may indeed escape a great housing crash in the US. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some seriously hot and dangerously tilted housing markets out there. So let's take a look at them, shall we? What I was relatively surprised to learn is that in the context of global housing bubbles, US cities very rarely feature as the most overvalued. Last year, analysts at Bloomberg looked at countries with overvalued housing markets and tried to devise what they call a bubble rank. In that list, the US came seventh behind countries like Denmark, the UK, Norway, Sweden, Canada, and New Zealand. Who would have thought that New Zealand had the largest housing bubble in the world? But ask any Kiwi and they'll tell you about how expensive cities like Auckland have become over the past two years. In that period, house prices have risen by over 25%, and the average house price in the city was close to 1.4 million New Zealand dollars, almost a million US. In terms of affordability, that's 35 times the median income. Part of the reason why economists are worried by the New Zealand housing market is because it has been propped up by a great deal of debt. And it's those people with the most debt who are doing most of the home lending, naturally. Take a look at this chart over here. It shows the percentage of lending that flows to those people with debt to income ratios over six times, i.e. heavily indebted folks. In New Zealand as a whole, it's 56%, while in Auckland, the number is 68%. What this means is that these debtors are going to be vulnerable to an increase in interest rates. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand has been pumping those rates, and the benchmark rate is now already at 2%. Fixed mortgage rates in New Zealand have already risen by over 250 basis points, according to Macquarie. This is having an impact on Kiwi's capacity to pay for those mortgages. Now take a look at this graph over here. It maps the mean national price of a home with that of the capacity for people to pay a two-year fixed mortgage. Until about halfway through 2021, they were both trending up. However, something changed after that. Notice it? Yep, the capacity to pay for a mortgage reversed course and started falling. Fewer people able to pay mortgages means fewer buyers, which means lower prices. This is already beginning to take shape in the country as the for sale signs start to pop up. Many economists are predicting that this could be the beginning of the bubble bursting, with falls of over 10% expected this year. This is troubling, of course, because houses are the collateral for the banks that have been issuing those loans. But what's even more of a concern is that this could be seen as a canary in the coal mine for all those other housing markets that have been driven by similar forces. The country that came second after New Zealand on that Bloomberg bubble list was Canada. Now this should be less surprising because it's been known for quite some time that Canada has had one of the hottest housing markets out there. Prices seem to keep going up at rates that just don't seem sustainable. Last year, in a similar study, UBS looked at some of the world's biggest housing bubbles. They ranked these in their Global Real Estate Bubble Index, linked to below. As you can see, the Canadian cities of Vancouver and Toronto were both in bubble territory. The latter was actually the second on the list. The average home price in Canada is 816,000 Canadian dollars, which is 50% higher than the equivalent US home price when converted to US dollars. In the past, this growth has been driven by demand from overseas buyers looking for a bolt hole. However, in 2018, the government implemented a foreign buyers tax, which it hoped would cool the market down. While it did have a temporary impact in 2018 and 2019, the pandemic brought with it a whole host of macro factors that supercharged the housing market afresh. Ultra-low interest rates, thanks to lax monetary policies, led to a rush of new home buyers taking out mortgages. On top of this, the lenders placed less stress on creditworthiness. Never a good idea. 
What's even worse is the fact that last year, a large percentage of those who had been taking out mortgages had been doing so into variable rate ones. In October last year, the market share of new variable rate mortgages surged to 51%. Now, it's worth noting that this is the highest it has ever been since the Bank of Canada began tracking the data in 2013. While rates on adjustable rate mortgages are generally lower than those which you'll pay on fixed rate mortgages, they do eventually adjust up. If the interest rates at the end of the initial term are much higher, you face a massive jump in mortgage payments. This could make them unaffordable and lead to repossessions and foreclosures. Interest rates are on the way up, and the Bank of Canada increased its base rate to 1.5% at the beginning of the month. Now, if you, like me, believe that we're heading for a high rates environment for quite some time, then that should alarm those borrowers. Already, these interest rate hikes and the withdrawal of government stimulus are having an impact on housing prices. In May of this year, we had our first ever fall in Canadian home prices as the benchmark home price fell by 0.6% from the month before. On top of this, sales plunged by 12.6% in the same month. Quite unsurprisingly, those markets that saw the most gains during the pandemic, the Toronto suburbs, had the biggest falls in the month. Again, falling collateral is never good for a bank's balance sheet. And it's well known that Canadian banks have outsized exposure to the real estate sector. So, will we see a broad housing collapse here? I don't know. But if it does happen, at least it could make housing affordable for the average Canadian, but to the detriment of current indebted homeowners. For every winner, there's a loser. Now that's it for most of today's video, but I'll leave you with a few thoughts. Something that struck me the most is just how much government policies in the wake of the pandemic have impacted all asset markets. The real estate market is no different. A global bubble that's been propped up by easy money and the allure of owning your own home. The US real estate market is again in bubble territory and there are many who fear the inevitable pop. Higher interest rates, more inventory, lower input costs. It's the complete reversal of the conditions that we witnessed in 2020 and 2021. Now, while this reversal is indeed concerning for those in the US, it's likely that we could avoid a wider scale housing meltdown. As long as those greedy bankers don't start originating, repackaging and betting on subprime debt, we could emerge unscathed. Here's hoping, of course. Now, of course, as we have covered here, the US is only one housing market and there are others that appear way more overvalued by numerous metrics. Canada and New Zealand's markets have been driven by many of the same factors that drove the 2008 housing bubble. Indebted borrowers overextending themselves on cheap credit, both of these housing markets now appear to be adjusting to the painful reality. Now, of course, these were just two examples of countries with hot markets, but they're not the only ones. Property markets in Australia, Sweden, Norway, the UK and Germany are also in bubble territory. So as central bankers start pumping the brakes and raising those rates, we will see exactly which housing markets were the most fundamentally unsound. As Warren Buffett likes to say, it's when the tide goes out that you see who's been swimming naked. And that's it for my video on the global housing market. But I'm really keen to get your feedback. Do you think that we're in bubble territory? Any Canucks or Kiwis care to opine on my analysis? Do you enjoy this type of content? So fire your comments down below. Oh yes, and while you're down there, something that you cannot miss is my socials page. It's here where I have the official links to all the places with exclusive content that you're not getting here. These include my Telegram channel with my daily market analysis, my Twitter with news and channel updates, my Instagram with some behind-the-scenes action, my TikTok for shorter flicks and general banter, and last but not least, my email newsletter. My once-weekly view on everything from the hottest coins to exciting trends. I also share a breakdown of my personal portfolio here, and it comes with a 100% spam-free guarantee. Oh, one more thing. If you're looking for some of the best deals and promos in the crypto space, then my deals page is the place. 
Links to this, as well as my socials, all in the tippy top of that description box. Finally, if you guys found this video insightful, then help YouTube help me help you. Turn that like button blue and don't forget to subscribe. Ping that bell as well for good measure. I have an exciting pipeline of videos that you guys cannot afford to miss. Now, time to say bye as this crypto guy has got to fly. Thank <laughs> you.